Welcome to the Combustion Chronicles podcast, where bold leaders combine with big ideas to create game-changing disruption. I'm Sean Nason, founder of Man on Fire, and your host for the Combustion Chronicles. Throughout this series, we're bringing together the most unique and influential minds we could find to have honest conversations about not being okay with the status quo, blowing shit up, and working together to influence our shared future. We believe that when bold leaders ignite consumer-centric ideas with passion and grit, the result is an explosion that creates a better world for all of us. I'm here with my co-host, Michael Harper, Chief of Radical Experiences at Mofi. On this episode, we are speaking with Sean Savinsky, one of the top 10 healthcare leaders in the U.S., Sean started his career by helping to build and then lead one of the nation's first large-scale wellness efforts for Fortune 500 clientele. Envisioning the widespread usage of the internet, Sean pioneered the development and delivery of wellness coaching online by inventing the first-of-its-kind personal coaching product, MyHealthCoach.com. This effort led to being a co-founder and the CEO of the industry-leading positive psychology-based coaching company, Hummingbird Coaching Services. Sean also adds to his credit the development and operations for two of the largest health system-based integrated medicine and wellness centers in the U.S., the Mercy Centers for Health and Wellness, located in Cincinnati, Ohio, as well as being the CEO of the international joint venture between Humana and Discovery Health of South Africa, to create one of the largest and most proven wellness incentive companies in the industry. Getting back to his wellness roots, Sean then took on reinventing the industry-leading population health company as the president of population health at Healthways, which was then sold to ShareCare in 2016. Sean just recently stepped down as SVP and president of Walmart Health and Wellness where he was responsible for leading the efforts towards creating the newly launched multidisciplinary Walmart Health. Sean, welcome to the Combustion Chronicles. Thanks so much, Sean. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. It's great to have you with us, Sean, and what an impressive list of accomplishments you have had in your career. But the probably the biggest question that our listeners are going to have is your experience and your time at Walmart and you being the integral part of launching Walmart Health. Could you share a little bit about what that experience was like and um, how, how you feel as you are moving on to your next venture and leaving that baby behind? Yeah, sure. Happy to. I have to say, uh, in my 30 years as a small company entrepreneur, one of the dreams you usually have is to have the biggest impact you can before you uh, end your time on this earth, hopefully far, far in the future. And when I was presented with the opportunity as that small company entrepreneur to lead one of the largest reinventions of one of the largest health and wellness companies in the country, it really was a dream come true. And the impact that could be had there was something that many of us only imagine because Walmart has such breadth and depth and quite frankly, a sense of community within the locations that they have across the country. They're they're quite a unique group. So uh, that was the challenge in front of us, a wellness division and business that had close to 100,000 people, was serving tens of millions of customers. Half of America walks through Walmart's doors on a weekly basis. So the volume and the clientele and the mix of lifestyles, backgrounds, ethnicities, it really is a melting pot of America, really created an opportunity to do something unique. And that's what we did. We looked at what the needs of the customers were. We looked at the communities that they were in. And we looked at what was going on in healthcare and where some of the biggest pain points were. And what we came to realize is that most of America can't really afford or doesn't have access to the basic primary type care in dentistry and primary care in terms of physician care, behavioral health, imaging, and a whole host of other services that when brought together in the spirit of what Walmart's all about, a convenient one-stop shop with the best products at the best price, it gave us an opportunity 
to create something like that in healthcare. And as you know, because you were there for the journey too, not an easy task to invent something new in healthcare and certainly not an easy task to create something that is largely cash-based and affordable for the average American. But we were able to do it thanks to the capabilities of Walmart. And it's making such a difference. It was a very proud moment when we launched the first one. And knowing that they're going to be continuing those efforts uh, makes me personally very proud. I would say a crowning jewel on my career and wanting to have an impact on people. And then, you know, I always do get the question, why would you leave all of that? And uh, early on in my career, I learned pretty quickly what I'm really good at and what I absolutely stink at. And uh, I'm really good at those first two to three or four years of a business, turning it around or starting it up or turning it around to restart it. And then once you get that baked and you get it right and it's ready to go from there, that's somebody else's skill set. That's not mine. And we just came to that time uh, at Walmart. It'd been about two years, maybe almost two and a half years, and we've gotten everything to a really good point. And it was just time for somebody new to come in that could take it from where it is today to the whole next level that they're going to be rolling out. Well, Sean, as you mentioned, yes, it. You know, we've been on this journey too, um, part of our organization with you these past two years, and it is a a jewel in the crown for us as well to see what um, powerful strides they are making to really change healthcare. And so we thank you for um, allowing us to be on that journey with you and the team at Walmart and and are very excited to see um, what's next for you. As I've known you for 10 plus years, you never cease to surprise me and amaze me on what you're going to go tackle next. And so let's talk a little bit, Sean, because here we are in 2020. I remember the second or third weekend in March, you and I were actually on a phone call um, discussing this new thing that hit America called COVID-19. And we thought, okay, this is a three-month, four-month thing. We've got to figure out how to face it and and do some things around it. And here we are when this airs, going to be six months, seven months into COVID-19 and It has exposed some pretty clear vulnerabilities in our healthcare systems um, across the U.S. and really across the world. If there was a vulnerability, if any, that surprised you or caught you off guard during this time, what would that be right now? Uh, Great question. And as you know, you could probably come up with a list of 25 or 30 things that surprised you at a societal level. I've been surprised in a pleasant way how this whole initiative of, uh, you know, COVIDing in place and bringing families back together and back to the dinner table, so to speak, it's really, uh, I think America in particular, from what I've seen and so many people that I've spoken with, it's actually brought a lot of families back to being centered around their families. And I, I think that is incredibly valuable for people's health and well-being, et cetera. I think when you look at the actual health side, there were two things that really surprised me. One was just how unprepared the whole testing laboratory space was. You know, in America and healthcare, everything begins with a test somehow. Blood test, uh, you know, you name it, a blood pressure check, um, something. When you decide it's time to go see a physician or see a healthcare professional or even self you know, kind of diagnose and take care of yourself for little aches and sprains and things like that. It starts with some kind of an assessment and a test. And so testing in laboratory is so fundamental to everything in healthcare. I was surprised how quickly it got overwhelmed and how many holes there are and deficits there are within that entire market. I was also surprised, equally so, exactly how overwhelmed and how quickly that overwhelming happened with the behavioral health and mental health side of the equation too. Having worked in both of those spaces at some point in time in my career, they've been around so long, they've scaled over time. But I think what probably happened in many cases is they got a flat utilization that they got used to. And so they built themselves around what they're used to and had no preparedness for what happened in COVID. But if you would have talked to many of those people even four, five, six months before, they would have told you they had 
near infinite capacity sometimes in certain ways. And I think we found out pretty quickly it's far from that. So those were two humongous surprises to the not so positive, specific to healthcare that uh, obviously are things of interest to me to now go and, and dig in and, and hopefully try to fix in a large way. Awesome. So, Sean, in 2019, you were surprised, I think, a lot of the healthcare industry when you um, appeared number seven on the top 100 healthcare leaders in the country, and frankly, over some of the biggest politicians who currently is our president. You were ranked higher than many of them on that list. So, when we start to consider crisis to be an ultimate disruptor, and I think the industry looks at you as not only an entrepreneur and innovator, but as a disruptor, what new healthcare adaptions or innovations that have been pushed by COVID do you think are here to stay after the pandemic has subsided or whatever we keep calling the new norm happens? Yeah, that, another great question. And by the way, on, on being ranked number seven, and no one was more surprised than me. I'd like to say it was because of me, but truth be told, it was probably just because of Walmart and who they are. And I had the opportunity and a platform to actually do some things that I've been contemplating but didn't have the platform for previously. And so uh, so that was a big surprise to me too. I think there are a couple of things, and, and oddly enough, they're not specific to treatment, meaning you know a new modality, a new intervention. It's actually around policy and law and to see things that have been the biggest barriers to people getting insurance across state lines, allowing pharmacists and other non-physician healthcare talent not being allowed to perform at the top of their licensure in most states, let alone across state lines. A lot of those kinds of things, I think, have really been great surprises have quickly changed, which was wonderful. And I don't think many of those are going to go back to the way they were before. I also look at telehealth and telemedicine as another example. The volumes that we've been seeing have shown a lot of cracks in the veneer of what works and what doesn't work in that space and how it may need to change. But what I do think it's done is pushed the consumer to adapt to virtual health care at a pace that would have never happened before. I, you know, a lot of people use this kind of an analogy, but I do think we did 10 years of advancement in people's readiness for you know, receiving care in a virtual setting in a matter of a few months. And that was something I don't think is going to revert and change back, which is only better for the whole healthcare system as a whole. So let's dig into that a little bit, Sean. As part of your career, we didn't talk about it in the bio, you led a a startup between GE and Intel called Care Innovations. And, you know, these remote technologies that you keep talking about and that you were just mentioning, you know, the, those have affected now our lifestyles, how we work. You know, there's some of the major companies and organizations in our country now are not even going to send people back into the workforce until well into 2021. And, you know, then this whole concept of telehealth, telepsychiatry, that's been around for a long time. Yep. <laughs> and even you, you and I have had a couple conversations previously to COVID that said, if something doesn't happen, telehealth, telepsychiatry, all of that is just going to go away. It's just not making the dent fast enough that it needs to in healthcare. But now that with all this happening, how do you foresee the future of remote healthcare trending? Do you consider it, is this just a blip because of COVID or do you think this is really here to stay now? I think a few things. Number one, and this will start showing my age, but back when I was doing the care innovations uh, business, remote monitoring of patients, you know, beyond people using Fitbits, which back then was like the hottest thing at the time, it was clunky equipment. They only looked at a few measures, you know, blood pressure, weight, that kind of stuff, movements within a home to try to take a guess at people's behavioral patterns, et cetera. But it was pretty rudimentary versus, you know, today, a lot of those pieces of equipment, you don't even know they're there. They may be on your body. They may sit in a flower pot on your dresser. They just the technology has progressed so much that 
now that people aren't aware that those big clunky things are doing those measurements on them, or it's so much easier to do, I think we'll see greater adoption to it. But on the backside of that, even you know, going back almost uh, nine, 10 years ago, those devices, as clunky as they were, pulled hundreds of bits of information off of people and would report those every second or every minute. And so the data companies and the healthcare companies, they didn't know what to do with all that. So they threw a lot of it out, quite frankly, and only went for the measure or two they were looking for. For those groups, like a Care Innovations, they looked at all the data and they kept it all. And they were able to find correlations between certain behaviors, certain actions, and outcomes of health that you would have never thought of before because most people just threw out the data they weren't looking for. I think with the sophistication of technology and the emphasis on analytics in healthcare for the past decade, I think what you're going to start seeing is all that information that comes off all these devices that people are now more willing to allow in their homes and on their bodies is going to be way more important and more closely scrutinized than it ever has before. So I think that part of digital health and remote health is going to only grow and become more valuable because the capabilities and the willingness are there. You know, I think with telehealth and telemedicine, you know, let's just be really honest. It wasn't anything more than video conferencing. So all it was is an ability to have more access to more physicians and healthcare professionals instead of the ones that were only in your area. But from a functional and operational perspective, it was no different than setting up an appointment at a doctor's office. You just had a larger variety of doctors to choose from, so to speak. Well, that system and that methodology back then was quite revolutionary to do. And today, it's kind of like big deal. It's a conference call, video conference call. And even with some of the biggest players out there, what I've seen and heard and experienced personally, when at Walmart, you know, is an hour and a half wait sometimes to wait on a doctor in a virtual waiting room, which is no different than sitting in the doctor's office down the street, so to speak. So I think what's going to happen now that people are more open to it and physicians are going, hey, this is a pretty cool way to practice and more will want to get online. You'll see that kind of old school yet invaluable virtual office, so to speak becoming more and more readily available. But I think the real breakthroughs are going to be in the artificial intelligence, the asynchronous communications that occur that are much more time and cost effective and, quite frankly, lend to better outcomes, especially in uh, mental health. I think you're going to see some innovations happening over the next three to four years that just weren't a priority before because there wasn't enough business to make you want to fund that next level of innovation. Hi, Sean. This is Michael. And I love talking about the what's next. I, I love all the futurist conversations. But if I'm being honest, I'm also a little tired of hearing about it because that's what everyone's doing. We're trying to predict, predict what's next, right? And we've got all these experts and these futurists who are waxing eloquently about it. What about the how? I think what I appreciate from previous conversations with you is about the how of what steps do we actually need to take? Like, what do healthcare leaders, influencers, people that can do this, or even we as consumers, what do we need to do to get this moving forward? You know, that, and I totally agree with you. Sometimes I sit and listen to a bunch of futurists talk about stuff, and you just want to throw up because it's not that it's not interesting. It's like, yeah, that's great. But some of it is so far-fetched, you go... Yeah, that's 20 years from now. I can't even get a doctor's appointment today. And in other cases, it's like, that's not a new idea. Just from my own personal position, so to speak, here's how I kind of think about it. And when I'm talking to individuals about their own health, or because uh, I am still a health coach at heart, or talking to companies about what to do next, I stop them talking about the future for a moment. And I say, Let's actually look at the customer and what the real need is, not what your need is as the company trying to sell them something or provide them something, but what's the real need of the customer? Let's get to the root of that, number one. And number two, very rarely, and I mean like less than 2 to 3% of the time, in my opinion, is there actually anything truly new in healthcare? When you think about new, right, you go from, hey, we used to have mainframe computers that only the biggest companies had and then came along little companies like Apple and Dell and Microsoft with technology, and you go, 
Now that's something new, right? Or even a microwave or a TV set when all that was available were radios. There's something brand new. But in healthcare, rarely is there anything new. And I was just having a conversation with a company yesterday advising them, and I won't mention their name, but they were talking about this great new thing they're doing where they're actually having people do a video call with a physician. And then if need be, that doctor will go to their house. And just how amazing and futuristic and great this is. And I said, that's awesome. Back in 1912, my great-grandfather in the family stories broke his arm. And so the doctor came to his house and fixed his arm. And they paid him with a chicken and two pigs. So welcome to 1912. You're a genius. And I think it's this kind of thinking to go back to the past, even in the pharmaceutical space, meaning the pharmacies, uh, talking to some of the pharmacy groups out there. They're talking about this new wave and this new future where the pharmacist is the center of a person's health. Welcome to the 1400s, maybe even earlier, where the pharmacist, the apothecary, was the doctor was the medicine man and was the nurse and the birther and everything else for that community or that neighborhood. We're just getting back to that. The only reason why that changed was because managed care started putting constraints and law started coming into place and it basically minimized the role of the pharmacist. And so there's a lot of stuff that people are inventing in quotes that actually aren't new, have been done before, or may actually be hundreds of years old it's just now people are rediscovering it. And so I always encourage people to go back to the basics, think about what was going on in health and care when their parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, if they know any stories or, or new folks in their family from then, and what did they actually do? And what's always funny to me, this hot craze right now is the last example I'll use of apple cider vinegar, this new thing that's only been around for like 10,000 years, but this brand new thing that everyone's all hot on. And when you talk to my mom, or I remember sitting around after dinner and my grandfather would take a teaspoon of apple cider vinegar after dinner to help with digestion and heartburn. These are not new things that people are coming up with. They're old things that they think are new. And so if you can focus on the past a little bit and glean from that, and if you can understand what the customer actually needs, not what you think you have to sell them, between those two things, you're probably going to find, A, how to solve their problems and not reinvent the wheel. And number two, you might just actually come up with something new, or at least a combination of things that's somewhat new. Brilliant. Love it. So in the spirit of that, Sean, I want to throw something different out at you around um, this concept of what people want and when they can have it. So. There are five things that consumers, and as you know, we do a ton of work in the consumer space, talk to consumers a ton around what they want in healthcare. We're going to get five bullet points that I'd like to ask you about. And I want to know in your mind, going back to what you're just talking about with what customers want, and even going back to, you know, let's look at what's happened in the past that's been good and bring it forward. When do you think this will happen? in the U.S. healthcare, because this is an election year. We're two months away from election. This is going to be a hot topic, I believe, coming forward. And now in you know your new ventures in life and what you're going to go tackle next. So here's uh, bullet point number one. People want to give their information only one time. When do you think that will happen? Well, if you want to base it on my experience of going to the orthopedic guy to have my knee taken care of over the last six weeks, we're going to the exact same location for the exact same doctor. I had to give my information every single time and sign the same paperwork. And looking at the promise of all the medical records from 10, 15, 20 years ago when they first actually started and looking at the mess that exists today, what I would say is I think we're pretty far away from that, unfortunately. So, uh, if I had to give you a number, I'd say we're a decade away. Such hope in that. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> so this is, uh, I can't wait for this one. People want to know what their bill will be and when it will be due. <laughs> that one actually, to give you some hope and optimism here, I think is coming quicker. That is such an issue. And so many people are having medical issues, but now they're unemployed and can't afford those or don't have insurance coverage. 
that they're having to default to payments, that hospitals and other groups who would send you six different bills for six different reasons, but it was really only one service and it's really confusing, that is actually, it's still horrible, but that's actually getting better. And there is a big push at the governmental level and then also, you know, in many of the health systems about having one bill, one way, the right way for everything, just like you would get in any other service that you would buy from a normal company outside of healthcare. So I think that one's coming quicker. I still don't think it's tomorrow. I think it's probably more of a four to five year kind of horizon, but I I think it's getting better. Well, that's good to hear. All right. People want the other 90% of their life outside of the healthcare industry to passively serve the 10% of their life that is interfacing with the healthcare industry. That's a big, tall order and can mean so many things. Geez, I'd hate to say you stumped me because then I'd probably have to buy a dinner or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I'm going to try to come up with an answer because I want to get out of that. I agree with the request. I know we've heard that in various ways many, many times. Gosh, I, I think that one, it's not a pipe dream. But I think we are quite a ways away from that. I think we're going to be close to that in terms of marketing and messaging from lots of different groups, employers, et cetera. But I think the practicality of that, I think we're way far away. It's it's really a cultural society thing that drives that ultimately. And I don't think we're there yet. Love the honesty. The last one here, people want choices. They want to be able to customize their care experience and adapt it to their personal preferences. You know, here's something you hear all the time from the healthcare world. People are dumb. They don't understand their benefits. They don't understand what they need. They don't understand fill in the blank. The truth is people actually aren't that dumb. And when explained in a way that's just matter of fact, people get it, they understand, and they can make logical choices. I actually think there have been many attempts at that with, you know, cafeteria plans at work for insurance where you can pick this or pick that. I think the entire healthcare industry, from hospitals, insurance companies, et cetera, are so inwardly focused and they suck so horribly at communicating with the customer in a quiet, simple, non-threatening, easy to understand way. The demands from the customers are going to start driving that more and more. And it's already happening. And we we saw it, as you know, at, at Walmart and those super centers for healthcare. The level of simplicity we had to get to, it wasn't the customer fighting us to say, no, 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 make it more complex. It was the practitioners who are used to being a certain way and the medical professionals who are used to acting and working a certain way. It was really them that had to make the change, not the customer. Customer actually kind of gets it. And if you say, hey, if you bend your knee this way, it hurts. If you don't bend your knee that way, it won't. And put some ice on it. Or you're going to end up having surgery, they're pretty smart and they'll go, I get it. But if you're sitting there using technical terms and then you're having insurance send them a bunch of information about that and have a nurse call them who confuses them, pretty soon they're like, I I don't know what to do. When it's as simple as don't bend your knee and throw some ice on it and do that for two weeks and you'll be just fine and avoid surgery. So I think it's coming because it has to and people are demanding it. It's not quick and easy. But the biggest challenge isn't the customer in this case. It's actually the healthcare professionals and system. Awesome. So, Sean, let's talk about like life lessons and, you know, what you have learned over your journey. So if you could go back to your 25-year-old self, because we won't even talk about how old you are on here. (laughs) But if you could go back to your 25-year-old self, what advice personally around failure around disruption what advice would you give yourself and and what would what you've learned in your life well first off i would have said invest in apple or microsoft or one of those groups and then retire when you're 27 but since that never works (laughs) and, and hindsight's always king in those ways you know what i would say is probably like a lot of folks you come out of college you get your first job and you don't want to screw it up and you want to try to do everything you can to do it right, and you're learning. I was blessed in one way of always finding myself in entrepreneurial kind of front edge scenarios where there wasn't a cookbook. 
where there wasn't a recipe already written for how to do that exactly. And therefore, there wasn't a choice but to go in and fail until you kind of found the right ways to do certain things. And then you made that the recipe to follow going forward. And so my entire career has been nothing but failure, <laughs> which I know is a very impressive thing to say, although I don't put that on my resume. It doesn't say <laughs> that. But my entire career has been about failure. It's been, a, if this business was perfect, you wouldn't have called me in to fix it. If someone had already solved that big problem out there and invented a solution to it, you wouldn't be calling me or entrepreneurs or other inventors. You know, there is inherently failure in solving things that people haven't solved before or combining things together in a way other people haven't considered before because most people tend to not want to fail. It's not always a matter of having not having vision or not being creative. I find that's actually not true. I think most of the time it's people a little more afraid to fail. So therefore, they won't just run out there and, and try what they think might work, learn from it quickly, and then try it again and fail a little less and fail enough until you finally get it right. Honestly, I just tell people, fail all you can. I mean, you don't want to like make a big blunder, have a bunch of people get sick or die from something you've done and go, hey, you know, it was an experiment. Don't go that way. But um, you can take calculated risk and just fortune favors the bold. And bold doesn't mean that you're always willing to charge forward. It means you're willing to charge forward, take the hits and the bumps and keep on charging. That's a great nugget for people personally, for leaders as they listen to this, Sean, that uh, most leaders aren't even willing to admit what you just talked about. And so thanks for sharing that and, and giving that to the audience. So, you know, uh, one more question and then we're going to jump into the last portion of this. You know, Sean, you, you think of Walmart. Walmart's the biggest company in the world. You just spent two, a little over two, almost two and a half years there. Um, and people can't even imagine why you would walk away from that or leave that. But I want to put a question out to you around what aspect of the healthcare industry would you most like to take on and totally disrupt next and just flip it on its head? Yeah. You know, every experience, you take a few takeaways from, right? There might be a hundred that you take away from your learnings every time you go do something, but there's always one or two that stick out as the big learnings. And there were two things I think I took away from the Walmart experience that I'd want to apply going forward. I had no idea what volume and scale looked like. And even many of the bigger companies I've worked with, like GE and Intel and others, they're big. They do a lot of volume and they do a lot of scale, but there's literally nothing like Walmart out there in terms of their size, their scope, their reach, and the, just the volume of stuff that they do. So many things. I learned what scale looks like, and it looks very differently than the way healthcare generally is organized and thinks. The other thing that I learned is uh, a sense of compassion for people. I do find that Walmart gets a lot of press here and there about, you know, how they treat people or how they treat their own employees. I've found them to be wonderful. And I think anyone that says that obviously hasn't worked there or doesn't know them very well. But the compassion they have for their customer and the communities that they work in and how hard they work at that, I think there's a combination of that going forward where you can create and take the notion of real scalability and volume to create something that can massively impact people at a very reasonable price in healthcare and do it in a way that's incredibly compassionate and community focused at the same time. And that combination is a sweet spot that's very hard to achieve. But I think when you achieve it, that's where you really get the big bang. Because as we all know, healthcare is very local. It's very community based. Yet it needs to be volumized and scaled in a way that it can be more cost effective and not so inefficient like it is today. And I think that's the intersection that I'm going to really seek. And again, as you know, as you and I have talked personally and, and talked with others, I think this whole testing laboratory space, I think the home care market and some of those areas are areas where scaling, volume, yet a true sense of compassionate community combined, you can make a big difference in people's lives, bring down the cost of basic health care needs and help everyone get a little healthier. Awesome. Well, as we are excited to see what you do next, I know there's a whole industry 
I know you have a hard time believing that sometimes, but a whole industry looking at what Sean Slavinsky is going to do next in healthcare. Um, so we are very excited to see that. So it's come to that time, Sean, in the Combustion Chronicles where we close each of our podcasts out with the combustion questions. And we talk about using this amazing algorithm to come up with these three randomly selected questions. And that amazing algorithm is Michael's head. As we've been sitting here, he has come up with three questions for you. So I'm going to turn this over to Michael. And Michael, take it away. Okay, Sean, are you ready for your combustion questions? Yes, because it came out of your head, I'm terrified, but go ahead. You should be. Uh, It's going to be a moment. It's going to be a thing. Number one, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be happy, and I want to be a fisherman. There you go. Deep sea or on a lake? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) With the cool hat and everything. That'll be great. That's right. Okay, question number two. This is a tough one. What is your favorite brand, flavor, and place to eat ice cream? Ooh, okay. So my favorite brand would be in Cincinnati, and all due respect to Grater's Ice Cream, which I love. Aglanisi's Brothers is actually my favorite. I love their banana chocolate chip. That's just me. So that's my answer. And where would you go to eat it? I, well, it's in Cincinnati, and I would go to Aglanisi Brothers uh, Ice Cream Parlor and eat it there. Oh, there you go. You wouldn't take it out somewhere. No, I'd actually eat it there. It's this this quaint little place where it looks like uh, the early 1900s and uh, got all kinds of candies. It's kind of like sitting in Willy Wonka's chocolate factory while uh, eating ice cream. There you go. Okay, number three for your combustion questions. What do you think about dodgeball? Oh, this is a political hot one, right? Because it's being banned at schools as being abusive and all that kind of stuff. But I freaking love it. Man, (laughs) when I was in junior high, because I was like six foot three and had these long, lanky, skinny, like spaghetti noodle arms, and I could just wrap that ball up like, you know, I was Plastic Man or something and let it fly. And I could just bruise the heck out of people and knock them out. I love it. I'm all for it. I think it builds character. Well, especially if it's dodgeball where you join a league and you're choosing to play, right? Well, yeah, there's that too. (laughs) (laughs) Now, on the next episode, we'll be talking about how to deal with Sean Savinsky's aggression. So, so Sean, thank you so much for joining us on this episode, um, sharing your thoughts, sharing your journey um, in healthcare. And uh, we look forward to what happens next. And we wish you the best and stay safe and be well. You too. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Combustion Chronicles. None of this would be possible without you, the listener. If you'd like to keep the conversation going, look us up at Man on Fire Social on Instagram and Facebook, or find us on YouTube at The Combustion Chronicles. Give us a shout and join our disruption movement. And check out this episode's downloadable recap page at manonfire.co. We know you lead a busy life, so if you're driving, exercising, or maybe you're just blowing your own shit up, don't worry. We've already taken the notes for you. Each recap is filled with guest information, episode themes, quotes, resources, and more. And remember, please subscribe, rate, and review if you like what we are doing. And if you don't, do it anyways. Stay safe and be well.